Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Addie, and I'm a principal product manager on the EC2 Digital Sovereignty team. I hope you're having a fantastic reinforce so far. Um, today's session is on control without compromise, the AWS European Sovereign Cloud. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we dive into what European Sovereign Cloud is, I want to talk, take a few minutes to unpack what digital sovereignty means, right? Um, and what we've learned in speaking with our customers, regulators, and partners is that there is no single definition of this term, right? It means different things to different people. Um, every country, every region has their own requirement. Um, and the, the, the strange thing about this is that, uh, you know, given the current scenario and and what's happening around the world, um, it has prompted governments to really go back and rethink how they want to control their data, their critical infrastructure, and basically their digital economy, right? Um, the challenge has been that uh, the, the definition is pretty fragmented as well, right? It's not uniform across industry sectors, verticals, or even the type of workloads. So uh, there have been attempts, however, uh, for example, there's a European cybersecurity scheme in Europe, uh, which is an attempt to harmonize the cybersecurity standards across the EU, uh, which is still in the works, right? Um, but I like to think of it as, um, you know, having control, control over your data, control over your digital assets. So um, we've sort of distilled some key themes, right, um, in terms of expectations that our customers and partners and regulators have around this topic. Um, the first one being data residency. Um, this is where customers want to be in control of their data, right? They want to know who has access to it and where it's stored and transferred to at all times. Um, the second one is around operator access restriction, which is tied to making sure that neither AWS nor a foreign government or an entity has access to their data. The third one is tied to the resiliency and survivability pillar, right? Which is more to do with how am I going to be able to sustain operations in the event of a geopolitical uh, situation or a disaster, uh, you know, or a technical failure and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last one has got to do with the independent side of things, which is where, you know, they all, customers want their local economy to thrive, right? They want to make sure that they're contributing to their economic and social fabric by uh, making sure that there, are, there is enough investment in the skills and the, and the infrastructure in their country. Um, so going off of that, right, um, as you know, we've seen the regulatory environment in this space evolve, right? Customers have told us that they do not want to be in a position where they have to choose between the power of a full-blown AWS capability versus feature-limited solutions, right? And which is why we strongly and firmly believe that customers should not have to make that choice, right? And from day one, AWS has been super focused in making sure that customers have control over their data and they have more choices in how they secure and manage their data in the cloud. Um, and we're very focused in making sure that customers are able to meet their digital sovereignty requirements without compromise by, you know, by a spectrum of the solutions that we offer. Um, 90% of our roadmap is based off customer feedback, right? So we announced our digital sovereignty pledge back in November 2022. And since then, we've made a series of announcements, right, following that pledge, uh, be it the launch of the external key store feature for KMS. I think there were two sessions before this. There was a gentleman who covered that. Um, two, talking about, like, dedicated local zones. And then, you know, we're going to cover the European Sovereign Cloud in a few minutes. So let's go ahead and perhaps take a minute, sorry, I'm just going to go to the next slide, and watch a quick video on ES, on European Sovereign Cloud.
All right. So now I'm going to dive deep into some of these、uh, aspects of the European Sovereign Cloud, why we're building it, and what it is. Right. So let's move on.、Um, AWS European Sovereign Cloud is a net new infrastructure offering, right? It is a net new independent infrastructure offering, which is different from our existing eight commercial regions in Europe,、um, and we've primarily built it for the public sector and the regulated industries who want to run highly regulated workloads on AWS, right? And there were two common themes that emerged, you know, as part of our working backwards with customers while we were thinking about、uh, how do we solve for this. Number one was around customers wanting enhanced data residency、um, uh, aspects, you know, to meet the data protection regulations and laws that are out there. And the second one was tied to、uh, providing additional operational autonomy, which is sort of tied to our resiliency pillar as well, right?、Um, And、um, AWS European Sovereign Cloud is pretty much an outcome of you know our decades of AWS experience of、uh, building、uh, separate infrastructures for the most critical workloads. And when I say that, I mean our Gov Cloud,、um, Top Secret, and Secret regions right across across the globe.、Um, I want to emphasize that this is not a snowflake, right? We want to make sure that customers and、uh, you know regulators around the world、um, are experiencing the same AWS experience that we offer in our commercial regions, right?、Um, and they have the same set of APIs with very little amount of legwork that they need to do to kind of move on to the European sovereign cloud. So on the screen,、um, you know, I want to talk about. I think you've watched the video.、Uh, it spoke about、uh, the first region for European sovereign cloud will be in the state of Brandenburg in Germany.、Um, on the left, you can see、um, our existing commercial regions, right? And then on the right, what you see is the AWS European sovereign cloud, which sits side by side.、Um, it is it is、um, designed exactly like our commercial regions, leveraging the multi AZ architecture. All the goodness of the nitro from the security standpoint, right? And、um, and if you look into the diagram, right on the screen, you can see that、um, European Sovereign Cloud will have its own IAM, which is Identity and Access Management stack, as well as a usage and billing stack, right? So what that essentially means is that you will have to sign up with a new account in order to access this European Sovereign Cloud, right?、Um, and and you will receive a separate bill for the same. I'm now going to talk you through with some of the attributes of the AWS European Sovereign Cloud, right? So, starting with infrastructure,、um, I think most of you will already know, right? AWS delivers the highest level of availability and resiliency compared to any other cloud service provider. And since day one, we've been very deliberate in、uh, making that choice of making sure that all of our regions are designed to be multi-AZ. And what that essentially means is that Each region comprises of multiple AZs, right? An AZ is a separate, independent partition in itself,、uh, designed to operate independently. And if you tend to zoom into what an AZ is, it consists of multiple data centers, right? Which are again separate facilities with their own redundant power and networking, etc.、Um, When we decided to build AWS European Sovereign Cloud, we've ensured that we are leveraging this architectural excellence that we have,、um, you know, implemented around the globe、uh, to deliver European Sovereign Cloud. The another,、um, you know, characteristic of the European Sovereign Cloud, which is tied to the enhanced data residency aspect. So、um, today on AWS, right?、Um, Customers already have control over their data, right? They are they know which regions they are selecting to store their data, where they are creating their EC2 instances, etc., etc. So customers are in control of their data and where it's stored on the AWS cloud. With European Sovereign Cloud, we have raised the bar in terms of providing enhanced data residency. And when I say that, I'm talking about making sure that. All of the configuration that customers need, to, which they set up to run their AWS resources in the cloud, which is called as customer-created metadata. For example, your IAM roles, policies, etc., tags, names, right? All of that data will also stay within this partition, which is the European Sovereign Cloud.、Um, 
the next characteristic I want to talk about is uh, the operational autonomy piece, right? And this is stemming primarily from, um, you know, questions and um, uh, expectations around what happens in case of a geopolitical crisis, right? Or if there's a natural disaster, how are we going to solve for that? And, um, you know, as you may be aware, um, our commercial regions around the globe, right, um, they are supported by our globally distributed engineering teams. Um, for European Sovereign Cloud, what we are doing is making sure that the operations for um, European Sovereign Cloud are done by EU residents who are physically present in the EU. And when I say that, I mean the scope is extended to um, not just customer service, but also day-to-day -day operations, the data center operations, as well as the technical support aspects, right? Um, all of this is being done to make sure that uh, you know, our customers have additional assurances over their operational autonomy aspects. Um, so what you can see here is a wide spectrum, right? Um, given that every customer has a different use case around their sovereignty requirements, right? AWS provides a wide continuum of solutions to meet these varied expectations. So we spoke a little bit about AWS regions. We spoke about European Sovereign Cloud. There's also the AWS local zones, which is pretty much bringing infrastructure to your facility, right? And then there's AWS Wavelength tied to the 5G networks, followed by dedicated local zones, Internet of Things, and Snow Family, right? Um, the idea here is that the legwork involved, right, uh, for the customer should be as minimal as possible in order to uh, meet their respective use case around sovereignty. And um, they can choose across these varied offerings, right, um, to, to accelerate their journey to the cloud. Uh, now, mind you, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It could be a combination, right, and I can, I'll tell you how. Um, so this slide talks about the dedicated local zones and outposts, right? Um, Dedicated local zones are for customers who have sensitive data and applications um, which need to run on physically separate infrastructure, right? Which is housed within uh, a choice, like within a facility where of their choice. And uh, with European Sovereign Cloud, now, as you saw in the spectrum before, um, there is the ability to parent these local zones and dedicated local zones and outposts um, to the European Sovereign Cloud in order to offer more in-country residency aspects, right? Um, so the continuum, like I said before, is not just either or, but it could be a combination that could be used together. Um, while we've been working with customers on, you know, trying to design and deliver European Sovereign Cloud, we've been also deeply and very closely collaborating with regulators, policymakers, and cybersecurity agencies to inform our roadmap and design for European Sovereign Cloud, right? Because it's really important for us to get the buy-in and support um, um, as we go ahead and deliver this in the future. Uh, for example, we've been working very closely with the Germany's Federal Office for Information Security, which is also referred as, to as BSI. Uh, I don't know if many of you know or not, but, but C5 has been uh, pulled together by BSI, right? And it is a highly respective standard across the industry and also across various geographies such as the APJ, etc. Um, um, AWS was one of the first um, uh, cloud service provider to be C5 certified. And BSI is just one example, right? We're really looking forward to collaborating with them to inform our roadmap and, and the design decisions as we get ready to deliver the European Sovereign Cloud. Um, um, and like I said before, it's not just BSI. We've been working with other regulators and other policymakers uh, to make some of these decisions and, and how we go about it. Um, I do not want to forget talking about partners because they're a big, big, they have, they're a big, they play a big role in um, the partner ecosystem with us. Um, and there are several ways in which partners can help us uh, with the European Sovereign Cloud, right? Um, be it building sovereign solutions on the European Sovereign Cloud or helping customers navigate, right, on the type of workloads and doing migration workload assessments, etc. cetera. So um, I would really recommend, like, you work closely with your partners, right, as a customer to uh, figure out what digital sovereignty competencies they have going 
going on for them um, and, and, and work your way with AWS on that. Um, as you saw in the video, um, right, um, European Sovereign Cloud is, is a full-featured cloud, right? Um, it is set to be launching at the end of 2025. Um, I will say that it is backed up by a 7.8 billion euro investment in terms of infrastructure, jobs creation, and skills development, right? And, and it builds on our long-term uh, commitment uh, to Europe and the ongoing support uh, to the region's sovereignty needs. So I will end this presentation uh, to say that, you know, you do not have to wait for the European Sovereign Cloud to get started, right? Um, we strongly believe that um, customers get the best um, head start to uh, get on the cloud by starting early. So you can already move on to our, Europe, our, our commercial regions in Europe to you know, play around in the build and test environments and, and see how you can leverage the power of cl the cloud for your customers, right? And I think what my, my recommendation here is to start by really speaking with an AWS team member to understand your use case, what are some of your next steps to get on the cloud. Um, I would also recommend to scan the QR code uh, to check out a wide range of white papers and guidance that we've been publishing online on this topic to access accelerate your journey on the cloud. Um, that's all I had for today. Thank you so much for your time.